Hello everyone, I'm Sophie and I'm currently at Kachara Forest Retreat, Bentong, Malaysia. And this is a room uh, on uh, Manjusri Hill. This is Manjusri Guest House. And currently I, I'm in a room and you can, as you can see, the, there's an altar set in every room that um, for people to come for retreat or just having a very um, peaceful stay. Right, I'll be reading from this book, Tales My Lama Told Me, by Pastor David Lai. And all the stories within were told by our Guru, His Eminence, the 25th, Sam Toku Rinpoche. So for today, I'll continue reading from Chapter 9, J. Songkapa, and it will be page 88. And let me share a picture with you while I'm doing the reading. Yes, this is a scene in a monastery. Okay, page 88. People who wanted to be ordained as monks would go before Jason Kappa's holy remains to make aspirational prayers. Their prayers would be a fervent wish that they would become an excellent monk or nun and that they would be able to uphold the Dharma and practice well. J. Songkapa is able to grant that because he was an absolute pure monk and therefore had the power to bless others to become pure monks and nuns also. These are just some examples of how his remains were a, great, a very great object of veneration, prayer and popular site for pilgrimage in central Tibet. J. Songkapa's contribution was prolific as he and his students founded many great monasteries. A monastery was founded in the very place where he was born, called Kumbum, and Songkapa himself built the great Ganden monastery that housed over 3,300 monks. His students went on to found the great Sara monastery that had over 6,000 monks, and the illustrious Drepong monastery that had over 10,000 monks. Tashi Lumpo was later built by the earlier incarnations of the Dalai Lama, which later became the seat of the Panchen Lamas. Another student went on to build the great Amdo Monastery, Amdo Tashikil, and the great Tantric colleges of Gyume and Gyuto that practiced only Tantra. Hundreds of monasteries were ordered to be built by J. Songkapa and his disciples. Monasteries like Sara in South India continues to flourish with over 6,000 monks today. It was originally built by J. Songkapa's disciple, Jamyang Choje, and J. Songkapa consecrated the monastery himself. He preserved the Holy Dharma by opening many monasteries, teaching not to an empty temple, but by propagating the Vinaya, or monastery vow, monastic vows and commitments to thousands upon thousands of monks and nuns. These monks would enter the monasteries to study and preserve the holy teachings of the Buddha. It is only within the Sangha that the holy teachings can be preserved strongly as only the Sangha have the time and energy to dedicate themselves entirely to the Dharma, often for their whole lives. J. Songkapa did much to preserve the teachings so that the world today can still practice the Dharma. All this arose because of his practice of pure monasticism and his efforts to propagate it. We have pure monks and nuns today because of the kindness of J. Songkapa. Even the very monk robes that we wear now were standardized by him. Tibetan monks have three layers of robes, a thin maroon dharma robe, another formal yellow dharma shirt that goes on top of it, and a maroon skirt at the bottom. These are the three robes of a monk. In ancient India, you will see that the top is bare with just a slight shirt, which can be anything except white or black, as it was very cold in Tibet. J. Songkapa adapted the original robes worn by monks in India and developed the holy monk robes that we wear today. The Dalai Lama wears his 
whereas this and all the four traditions of Tibetan Buddhism have adopted the same. A real monk will never have to wear protection or anything on his body. This is because the robes are the real protection. In fact, people who travel with fully ordained monks in Tibet, who may not necessarily be Rinpoches or highly realized beings, but normal, ordinary monks, feel particularly safe. This is because when they travel to sinister sinister places that are afflicted by spirits or people who are depressed, they would take a real monk's robes, cover up that place or person and recite prayers. When they take the robes off, the spirits are chased away or the person calms down. That is the power of the monk's robe vows. It was J. Songkapa who developed this special design for the monk's robes. The edge around the arms is made to resemble the ears of an elephant. When you fold over the collar, you have a little opening here to make it look like the eyes of an elephant. You may wonder why monks run around wearing robes that resemble an elephant's head. This is highly symbolic because elephants are strong, steady, stable, and have a lot of patience. A monk should possess qualities of an elephant when he practices the Dharma. He too should be stable, strong, and have great patience in his Dharma practice. So all the good qualities that a strong, powerful elephant re represents, a monk should also embody. Elephants have a very significant symboli symbology within Buddhism. It was also well known that before Buddha Shakyamuni was born, his mother had a dream of a six-tusked elephant, which represented the coming of Buddha Shakyamuni. The very fact that the holy vows of the monk still exist today in Tibet is large, largely due to Jay Songkhapa, who is regarded as the king of the Dharma. He achieved this by ordaining, sorry, ordaining thousands upon thousands of monks and nuns, causing monasticism to spread all over Tibet. In the scriptures, it is said that where there is sangha, the Sangha, the Dharma will grow. Where there are no monks or Sangha, the Dharma cannot grow. You can observe this when you go to a temple where there are no real monks. I'm not talking about a silly monk like me or any business-minded imposter monk. I'm talking about real monks. When you go to a temple that has a monk with knowledge and he can teach, the impact is incredible. Therefore, the survival of monasticism is largely due to the kindness of J. Songkapa, who held on to his monk, ro monk vows and spread it everywhere. It is important to note that he did not discover or make this up, but based it all upon the traditions of the great Indian masters of Nalanda Monastery of ancient India. In this way, he perpetuated Buddhism for many generations by building monasteries and upholding pure monasticism. He knew that the best way to preserve the Holy Dharma would be by the ordination of more monks and nuns and he didn't stop there. He strove to teach and inspire them to be teachers and to hold on to their vows well. Hence, even the curriculum being studied at the monasteries today was originally inspired by J. Songkhapa's teachings. As a result of this, we have enlightened beings still existing today, creating a great impact all over the world. For example, we have the Dalai Lama, it is again through the kindness of J. Songkhapa that these incredible lamas are around. It was because J. Songkhapa had a vow to pass down the teachings, the tantras, the initiations and the practices, and because he held his vows and fulfilled them. These teachings combine three holy and logical sects, sects like three rivers coming down from one great mountain, the Shakya, Nyingma, and Kagyu traditions, which J. Songkhapa combined with the pre-existing Kadampa tradition to one great tradition called the New Kadampa, later renamed as Geluk. 
So if you like Tibetan Buddhism or any of its forms, you would be practicing it all within J. Tsongkhapa's tradition because he literally combined all three aforementioned traditions into one, Galuk. In that way also, you would also be practicing all three great schools of Buddha's teachings, Hinayana, Mahayana and Vrajayana. This ultimately means that when you practice J. Tsongkhapa's tradition, you are actually practicing all forms of Buddhism that exist in the world. Hinayana as practiced in the beautiful Theravadan tradition and Mahayana and Vrajayana as practiced in Northern Buddhism. You would be practicing the three main lineages that originally came from ancient India and are still alive today. The incomparable J. Tsongkhapa had many gurus from all three traditions that were combined into a single tradition. So, when you practice the Galuk teachings, you are practicing the synthesis of Hinayana, Mahayana, Vrajayana, Kadam, Shakya, Kagyu, and Nyingma. It means that it is a really concise and complete spiritual path. Therefore, a Galupa practitioner who follows J. Tsongkhapa's teachings and lineage must especially respect all other denominations of Buddhism. You will never ever see a real Galupa Lama criticize another denomination of Buddhism. A follower of J. Tsongkhapa's tradition should never be biased towards others nor ever make any negative distinctions between the different denominations of Buddhism. A real practitioner will never make such distinctions because the teachings are the synthesis of all the Buddha's teachings. If you criticize any denomination of Buddhism, you would actually be cutting off one branch of J. Tsongkhapa's teachings. J. Tsongkhapa also had this ability to help us make a connection with Maitreya Buddha. This is because when J. Tsongkhapa passed away, he took rebirth as a Bodhisattva disciple of Maitreya called Essence of Manjushri or Jampe Nimpo. J. Tsongkhapa's main emanation is now in Ganden Heaven or Tushita by the name of Jampe Ningpo. But he is the main disciple of and sorry, and he is the main disciple of Maitreya Buddha. When we pray to J. Tsongkhapa, we are connected with him in Ganden Heaven, and thus we also create a direct connection to his guru, Maitreya Buddha. So when you do J. Tsongkhapa's practices, you are therefore also practicing the great method and love that is embodied by Maitreya. His very name, Maitri, is the Sanskrit word for great love. At the same time, you create a connection to be able to receive the teachings of this future Buddha, Maitreya, when he descends to our earth to teach the Dharma. Thus, even if you are not diligent with the practice, you can still create the cause to be reborn amongst Maitreya's disciple. In the future, when Maitreya takes rebirth here to manifest his enlightenment and teach, you will be drawn towards becoming his student. Before that, you will probably be still hanging around, having a good time going out, fighting with your friends and giving all sorts of ego trips. All of us do that all day long. If we are still hanging around in samsara, when Maitreya appears, I can assure you that by practicing J. Tsongkhapa in this life, you will be reborn as one of Maitreya's closest disciples. J. Tsongkhapa was predicted by Buddha Shakyamuni to become the 10th universal Buddha to appear in our world. Shakyamuni himself was the 4th Buddha and the 5th one will be Maitreya. The 10th universal monarch will be J. Tsongkhapa, who will manifest enlightenment in Bogaya as the living Buddha of that age. Therefore, when you pray to J. Tsongkhapa, you are also making a special connection to the 10th Buddha to appear in this world, who will turn the wheel of Dharma in this spiritual dark age. And that is the end of my story on J. Tsongkhapa. 
And so, as um, Rinpoche shared, we should um, at least propitiate um, Jay Songkapa's practice that um, we have a strong connection with the coming Buddha Maitreya. And also, as um, Jay Songkapa was predicted to be the 10th Buddha, we, if we are still in samsara, then we will also make a connection with the 10th Buddha, who is Jay Songkapa. And as you can see, when you are diligent in your practice, and if you, and as the effort that you know Jay, Jay Songkapa has put into his practice, um, then one is able to gain attainments. And so, don't lose the chance. Life is short, as Rinpoche always says. Well, thank you for sharing your time with me. And now we'll end this with a completion dedication in Tibetan. Jangju Senjo Rinpoche, Makipa Namge Yushi, Kipa Nampa Mepa Yang, Goni Gondo Pewash, Doni Tunga Rinpoche, Makipa Namge Yushi, Kipa Nampa Mepa Yang, Goni Gondo Pewash, Daso Jini Sapa Gewa Di, Tanan Droa Guna Kampada, Jepa Jesu Nosan Trapa Yi, Tamping Yin Porin Tu Sa Se Sho, Kewa Kuntu Yen Dalamada, Drami Cho Kipa Lano Cho Chin, Sadam Langi Yat Tera Sone, Doji Changi Ngopa Ngotu Su, Gewa Di Yudu Da, Lama Sangyo Driyone, Drewa Chikya Malopa, Dei Sala Kupa Sho, Joki Gyao Pusu, Sungapa, Chosunam Pape Wala, Geki Sama Siwa Dang, Tunki Malu Sangwa Sho, Dadam Sengi Dusunda, Drewe Songi Latine, Gewa Lawson Trapai, Tampayo River, Gyushi, Nimo Dele Sendele, Nimi Gunyan Dele Shin, Nisin Tatu Dele Pel, Kunchu Sungi Jingilo, Kunchu Sungi Ngodruso, Kunchu Sungi Trasi Sho. Jesu Lama Kusen Rapting Ching, Nam Katrini Cho Cho Kipada, Lossam Tempe Dro Mi Sap Sungi, Dro E Munsa Tato Ni Gyushi, Gangri Rao Hui Ko Wei Shin Kam Den, Pendan Den Wa Ma Liu Gyo Wei Ne, Chan Ren Sik Wan Ten Sing Gat So Yi, Sha Pe Shi Ri Pa Ru Ten Gyushi, Hum Tong Pe Ngotru Ma Lu Pa, Den Den Dala Sao Du So, Ko Dan Den Pa Long Shok Na, Ke Pa So Shik Shuk Ten Sel. Thank you again, and please do join me for my next sharing. And we'll be doing a new story. <laughs>